All right, so I think we can start. So welcome, uh, and thank you so much for joining these panel discussions, Lessons from Vertical Industries. Uh, so you can see our panel is here Cornelius is missing, <laughs> and that's because uh, all of the rainings and so on has delayed or even cancelled flights, trains. So Cornelius was one of these persons. Uh, we are really sorry to miss him, but we have our great panelists here who will be able to answer and to go through these interesting and topics uh, about challenges and uh, best practices. So to start with. I would like you to uh, get introduced uh, all of the panelists, but before that, um, I I recently shared this QR code. This is for all the attendees in the room. We want this panel to be interactive. We want this panel to be a dynamic where the answer, the questions that are asked to these panelists are meaningful to you. So. Uh, for, to do that, please scan this QR code. We already tested and looks like it's working. So you can, it will drop, uh, guide you to a dashboard where you can add questions. You can even vote for the questions that are already there. If there are a lot of questions, I will prioritize uh, those questions that has more votes on it. And we will ask uh, our panelists on the way. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing these slides really briefly. So, this is the moment for you to scan. All right. And saying that, let's get introduced to the panelists. Um, Carol or Jonas, whoever wants to start. Good afternoon. I hope you had a great lunch. So, great to be here. I'm Jonas van Bogart. I'm leading the Open Source Program Office at Aliander. For those who are not yet familiar with Aliander, we are one of the distribution system operators in the Netherlands, where we manage uh, the electricity and uh, gas grids, uh, among others. And it's our key task to make sure Dutch households and companies have access to energy at all times and stay warm and uh, keep the lights on. Could it takes a moment to connect. Why don't you go first while I work on it? Is it on? Okay. Um, yes, my name is Karl Rietveld. I work uh, with the Chief Technology Office of the Dutch Tax and Custom Administration. I don't think it needs an introduction. What, uh, what do we do? So we collect tax and uh, yeah, that's what we do. Is, oh, you want me to talk more? Uh, no, that's an introduction. We'll uh, go to that. Is it working? Um, I, so um, Wolfgang from Mercedes-Benz tech innovation. I have a problem with the microphone technology. But other than that, I'm a FOSS ambassador and I lead the open source program office at Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation. And uh, I am looking forward to your questions. Awesome. And well, for those who doesn't know me, I'm Ana Jimenez and the project manager in one of the Linux Foundation project best practices that is called the To Do Group, focused on open source program office uh, and open source strategy best practices within organizations. Um, so I think the first questions before getting into the audience questions that I already saw there are uh, some questions there would be how does open source uh, help in innovation inside your company, specifically to your sector and also to your uh, to your industry. I think for the people in the Netherlands uh, have seen the news. Uh, there's a huge challenge regarding the energy transition, and how can we make sure that uh, we make our energy grid more sustainable? And also move more from, uh, especially in the Netherlands, we have quite a lot of gas-focused uh, energy consumption, and to move to more, more electrification. And that's a huge task for us as a company uh, to make that true. Uh, we literally have to triple the grid capacity in the next few years. And that's one of the reasons to really accelerate that uh, transition for us as a company. Uh, we invest in digitalization. And um, one of the ways we see to scale up our digitalization efforts 
is to also invest in collaborations. And that's also one of the reasons that in our new digitalization strategy, one of our key themes in, in, in that strategy is collaboration and partnerships. And one of the ways we see uh, we, are, we aim to achieve that is through open source. And we see that building those new digital capabilities to better use the grid capacity that's uh, available in the electricity grid uh, needs new investment in new digital capabilities. And we see open source as a way how we can combine uh, resources, our internal resources with that from other industry peers, but also from, from vendors uh, and research institutes uh, and combine those research uh, resources and investments to build these new capabilities. And we really see, uh, of course, open source not the only way, but we see one of the ways where we can leverage the success of open source in other sectors, also in our sector, to drive that innovation and to really build those common uh, digital capabilities we really need to accelerate uh, the energy transition in the Netherlands. Still not working? Um, in our organization, we are quite used to doing uh, technology for a longer period. Um, so not only a technical innovation, but it can be a process innovation. So for example, we're um, looking at S bombs. For example, we're doing that for a longer. Uh, we're doing not S bombs for a longer time, but we're looking at inventory for a longer time. But a technology like an S bomb came in, and it gave us a jump start to have more detailed information uh, and to provide it within the process of automation. Uh, generating, uh, uh, scanning, uh, analyzing it. So th it's real chains of information. So um, developers have more information, but not only the developers, but also different colleagues like architects, like managers. So it's not only a technical innovation, it can have a jump start. So it was for us really nice to see that it can be really fast. The technology is moving quite fast, but it's also changing the way we look at information. Um. Now I have one question. Let me uh, let me just add oh, yeah. just, just just to jump in and just add something real quick. Um, so basically, I think what it comes down to is innovation nowadays happens in open source. Innovation in software happens in open source, and you're either there and participate or you're not. Okay, that's basically it, I think. And for example, in the automotive industry, you know, a car is. Like we used to bend steel sheets in certain ways and in the end the car comes out. Uh, but nowadays it's more like a data center on wheels and there's lots and lots of software involved. And again, innovation in software, open source. You can collaborate with other companies in the, in the uh, industry in open source. You know, and before that was much more difficult. So that's it. Yeah, so we, we got a lot of questions. The, the top one that raises right now is about challenges. So in what dimensions do you see unrealized potential of open source being blocked by law, regulations, risk, or uncertainty in your respective industries? Any thoughts on that? Um, so wait, in, can you please say that again? In yeah, so it's it's about like uh, how how does uh, because of the risk, the law, the regulations, uh, where do you can find unrealized potential of open source in your industries? Like people doesn't realizing how powerful or how important is open source in terms of laws. Like for instance, um, seen in the uh, European uh, recent laws on and how they tackle open source, for instance, just. If someone wrote that and wants to clarify, just let me know. <laughs> yeah, if I understand the question, then for us as a government entity, look at what AI is doing. So if if you look at the law, then we're not able to, to use it, to implement it, uh, if there's not a contract. Um, so that's unreleased potential. Uh, and it should be, at, well, I think it's a hazard. Um, and it's missing potential. So if we're not allowed to do it and implement it in our own process, then how, um, well, how on, on, on an effect on the developer side, they want to use the technology, but if we're not allowed by law, so how do we keep all those developers that want to use the technology and want to be open about the technology and want to inv invent if they can reuse it 
and implement it in our processes and make it efficient, but we're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's a risk. If I'm not sure who asked the question, but yeah. Okay. Um, so if I understand the question correctly. <laughs> I mean, so laws and regulations are ideally there to help us, to protect us. Yeah, and so the legal department in a big corporation, they're usually there to stop bad things from happening. That's their job. But they must not do this at the expense of innovation, right? Now, engineers, it's their job to innovate. And so they, they want to create new things and they want to take risks, but they can't do innovation at the expense of maybe threatening the company. Okay. So these are two conflicting interests and you just have to work together. And, and I experienced this also on our beginning open source journey, you know, our legal department was more restrictive and they said, well, you know, I'm not sure about this. Maybe you should not do this. And the, uh, engineers said, but we want all in and you know, okay. So you have to, talk to each other, find out which interests benefits the company most without taking risks that threaten the company. Okay. And that actually, if you get people together at the table, that, that can actually work quite nicely. I think you, you phrased that really correctly. I saw a similar thing happening also in our sector is uh, there's a lot of cultural resistance against open source. And most of the time uh, that is because Open source is, especially in our sector, is still something new. Eh? We're just getting used to our uh, transition to more uh, get a more digital company. And that brings all new kind of topics uh, that come on board, open source being one of them. Uh, especially, in, uh, it raises a lot of questions in different departments, uh, legal being one of them, but also in regards to procurement or security. And I think uh, one of the barriers and challenges to, to to uh, build up those skills and knowledge in your organization to address those questions and worries uh, and see how you can take them seriously, but also uh, make it possible uh, that those barriers are not limiting uh, your organization to use open source for innovation or contribute to open source to stimulate innovation or even create open source from your innovation uh, projects internally. <laughs> Um, another question I have here are about the what key difference do you find between commercial enterprise OSPOS and government OSPOS? And government. And government. government. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, speed. That is, a, that is a good factor, speed. I guess uh, in private companies, private sector, you have more pressure to innovate and more pressure to move forward. Uh, in governments, they usually lean back for a little bit and kind of watch things. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, and then and then when they're <laughs> yeah, and and then when when it's like too loud, then they're like, you think we should do something there? And then they wait until the next elections, and then maybe they do something. <laughs> That's a dark pig. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I'm not fully agreeing with that. So, okay. uh, <laughs> as a, a greater company, we are not uh, we are semi-public. We sort sort of in the middle. But I think the biggest difference is that the motivation uh, is different. Yeah? You see that from a private organization, uh, the biggest motivation is uh, how we can make more return on our investment. That's not primarily the key motivation. For, for for our organization or public organizations. And for us, uh, the, it's really a drive to see uh, how can we make sure, uh, that's also one of the reasons we are open source, is uh, not to make more money about out of our digital investments, but how can we make sure that these new investments in digitalization really help us to do our key tasks as a company uh, better uh, and more efficiently and more effectively. And that, and that motivates, uh, I think, different reasons to invest in open source. Uh, and also particularly, uh, uh, most of our companies and public organizations are also funded by public money. Uh, and uh, public money, public code, I've probably uh, said here uh, more often, is also, uh, I think, a motivation which more strongly applies to, to, to public organizations, semi-public organizations, than private organizations, for example. 
Yeah, so uh, all joking aside, I mean, the I think the cost and time pressure on the public sector, on the uh, on, uh, government sector, might not be as strong as in uh, uh, companies. But we are seeing a lot of government agencies and governments doing really great work in open source as well. So, I mean, he will tell you a bit more about it. That's really one good example from the Dutch tax administration. But also the city of Paris has been invested in open source a long time. Uh, the city of Baltimore as well has open source programs. And now the German government is doing stuff at, at Sendis is uh, one of the organizations and, and other places. So we're really seeing more and more uh, governmental organization governments are doing this as well and then for example the you may have heard of the ospos for good conference at the united nations there were a lot of governments there who were interested in a topic yeah thank you uh, <laughs> no, but referring to the speed, uh, the procurement is an issue for uh, public administration. So that's referring to the speed and time. Uh, it takes a lot of time to procure software and not, al not always there comes open source software from a procurement offer. So that's a challenge. Um, yeah, we're doing... It takes a little bit more time because you want to do the right thing as a public administration. So you have some a lot of internal regulations that you need to um, be aware of. Um, there's also the, the issue of everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of management layers you have in there. So everybody needs to be aware of what you're doing. If you're open sourcing your first project, which you were actually hoping to do quite fast, I'm not allowed to say anything about it, but that's also an issue. You're not uh, allowed to speak openly about everything. So that's also an issue as a public administration because of regulations. Um, um, but if you get to the point to open source your project, it takes a lot of time and people and roles in your organization to convince of what you're doing is actually a good thing. Um, yes, referring to the public money, public code, we are funded publicly with public money. So you need to provide your own code back, but it's not easy. Um, we're doing it for 20 years already, building a project with open source. But then you have to switch the mindset of, okay, we're opening our own project right now, um, looking at co code quality, looking at vulnerabilities, looking at uh, are we doing the right thing as a developer. So that's, that are all topics that are quite interesting and take a lot of time to have the right settings, have the right mindset, have everybody convinced that it's okay and it's safe and it's secure. So yes, time is an issue, but also regulations is an issue, but eventually you get there. Mm -hmm. um, another question is about uh, how do you define the impact factor? Maybe it, this is role of the OSPO or maybe it's somewhere else across the organization to decide we're gonna contribute to, we're gonna invest in this project across the entire open source ecosystems. I know there might be not just one um, answer to that, but, uh, and it might be difficult to frame, but I don't know if you have some uh, recommendations on impact factor to when selling, well, not selling to the organization, but when trying to say to the organization, we should be contributing uh, to this project, in, in, where are you basing this? Uh, quite a difficult question, I think. But as an OSPO, I do believe um, that if we are using software, then it should be normal um, to contribute back to what you're using. So it should be normal to, if you find something in an issue or you, uh, you need to change something in the code, that it should be normal to contribute back. So it should, and contribution not only by money, but also by hours, by providing feedback, by improving. It's yeah, but I think the question is more like, okay, OSPOs and open source people know that, but how do you translate this to the organization? How they believe also the way you're believing on this? I know it's hard and, <laughs> but I think, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but for the you know for the recording, I think uh, you we need the microphone for the recording. 
Thanks for, for the question. Um, so if you have an organization, say 10,000 people, 100,000 people, um, and you know that uh, the software is used by, say, five or 10,000, um, wouldn't it make more sense, theoretically, so I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, to invest and point people towards, let's contribute to that uh, project, let's focus as an organization, because ultimately the return of investment based on time is, is more word, uh, worthy of that time. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't contribute to the other projects, I would say, but then like, how do you herd your organization basically towards, let's focus on, say, Kubernetes, or in, in my case, I work for GitLab, that's my, my job to try to get people to contribute to GitLab, um, because a lot of people use it. Um, but I'm curious what the thinking is within these OSPOs or within these organizations on the herding of people. I think it's a great question. And so how we look at it from, from our OSPO perspective, uh, our investment in open source is always uh, a strategic decision. Yeah, because uh, also uh, I really... Uh, admire also uh, the, 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 uh, that we try to uh, contribute as much as possible, but the resources and time and money you have is always limited. Uh, so you have to see where do you put focus. And for us, uh, there are a few things that drive that focus. So one of the things is uh, what are strategic uh, topics where we really expect to innovate in the next coming years. And those uh, topics are also often the, the topics where we seek for, for collaboration, yeah, for seeing other peers of our, other organizations that are active in those top, with those topics as well, and that can be existing open source projects, or we may start up a new open source projects with those peers. So that's one of the drivers to identify key, key innovation uh, projects for our space. Other way around, uh, it's also interesting to uh, we also focus to see how, what are now open source projects in our organization that are very important to us and that they play a crucial role in our uh, daily uh, operations. And also there we see, seek to seek uh, for which uh, from of these projects uh, is it strategically smart uh, to get more active. And it can be sometimes motivated by uh, uh, that are crucial projects in our organizations, which are part of the uh, vital infrastructure, and to make sure that those projects keep uh, safe and are secure, and that we get more involved in those projects uh, to keep them that way. But it can also be uh, that we have specific features uh, that we are missing in those projects, which we like to contribute. So my advice is uh, uh, for, for all those which are also in their organization working on identifying hey, where to start, uh, I would always take a strategic approach uh, where, yeah, where it can make most sense and has the most impact for you as organization uh, and start there. Yeah, so um, it is a difficult question. And uh, I tell you, in a big organization like Mercedes-Benz, it's, it's not, first of all, it's not very easy to even find out who's contributing where, right? So in general, we are encouraging all of our engineers to contribute back to open source projects that they work on, that they use, yeah? Um, so that's on a micro level, basically. We, we tell everybody, please, you know, go out there in open source and be active. And then on the on the macro level in the OSPO, uh, we try to find out so what is of strategic importance to us and what is interested. Where should we invest our time and money? And so, for example, at memberships, so we're members of the uh, Eclipse Foundation, of Linux Foundation, of several others. Yeah, but so that even was, where are we members? Let's let's try to find out. And uh, here's uh, my colleague Gunnar in the back, uh, who's like he, he asked that question. Like, well, do we know all of our memberships? We just have to find out. Yeah. And so we started collecting that. And I mean, we knew the big ones, but we are not so sure of some organizational unit that is membership that's member in some other. So at the um, OSPO level, I, we, I kind of think we know where we are members, but then we are now deciding where should we stay, what should we not do, what should we take up. Yeah. So, you know, Linux Foundation, Automotive Grade Linux, for example, or STV, Software Defined Vehicle, at the Eclipse Foundation, like, and, and who does what and where. And so it's, it's not easy. 
In our case, that's not the role of an OSPO um, to look at what kind of technology we are allowed to. So we do focus on if we start using a particular open source project, then we do have a lot of um, uh, regulations about that and um, we see if it's a viable project. Um, but the architectures within our organization have a, a plan on what technology is being used and what technology is being um, uh, removed in the next couple of years. So that's not a role of an OSPO. I'm going to connect that answer to another question that was, how can us, well, if already you're OSPO or how can OSPOs collaborate across borders? And if your OSPO is doing that, what challenges are you facing? And I think it's also related with the kind of like collaborating with foundations, like, okay, where I'm, so, so I'd be investing, but. We've been working on a project to uh, analyze our uh, software bills of materials. So it's not a Linux backed phone uh, product, so I won't refer to it. Um, but we know that the German government is also using the same project um, and also um, creating procurement questions for within Germany to improve the project. So there's a service created internally for, uh, in Netherlands created and the German government would like to implement the Dutch service into that project. So that's a collaboration on, on a product level. Um, the challenge we have, for example, with the German uh, OSPOs, their repositories are all German mm. and not English. And the most of our, yeah, that's a challenge because the most of our code is uh, written in English. Um, uh, how to's and guidelines are written in English, um, but specific documentation is written in Dutch. So language is also something that's really a challenge. Um, and the challenge is there are a lot of different repositories with a lot of, uh, they're based, hosted on different instances. For example, GitLab, GitHub, uh, Codeberg, a lot of different locations where you need to search for all the different repositories. So that's a big challenge. So uh, Mercedes obviously is a multinational corporation and uh, we have uh, colleagues in many countries. Now the OSPO headquarters is in, in Germany and so there the rules are basically set that are valid for the entire corporation. Now of course there, there might be national laws that are not affected by this obviously that you know they still have to consider national laws but trying to think I'm not an, ex an expert here on, on law, but I don't think there is a conflict there at all. Um, but so the question is, do we need OSPOs in all the country units as well, or should they just work with us? And, and the answer I think is something in between. So they need local OSPOs that work together closely with the headquarters, you know, it's like, so what's your problem over there in India or in Malaysia? Tell us about it. And then how we can, how can we help you? And maybe they don't make the rules, but if they require rules, then, you know, we'll talk. Um, if they require incentives, you know, we can maybe help them, but also it's about culture. You know, when we do community management, maybe we can't do community management for them. I mean, they're there, they're really closer. So they should do that locally. Okay. So it's, it's very interesting. You have to, um, consider all the, all the cultural differences as well. And basically, so we're asking them, Hey, you do your OSPO spreading the good news of FOSS locally where you are, because you know best how to reach your community, right? There we had an interesting talk by Daniel Izquierdo uh, this morning about cultural yeah, differences. Yeah, I was about to, to mention, it was a really interesting talk about the difference between Europe slash Spain versus uh, China and how open source contributors in each community acts different and, and they have di different channels, different ways to proceed and the challenge of feeling welcome into open source communities, which was really interesting. That's very interesting to hear that uh, as being a global company like Mercedes, the challenges are way different than uh, being a company like Aliendo, which is way more local focused. So I recognize a lot more challenges. Uh, Carol's already mentioned that first, uh, open source really opened the doors for collaboration outside the Netherlands. Uh, we used to have quite and still have many collaborations inside the Netherlands. Uh, with uh, peers, but open source really opened the doors for more collaboration also on European and even a global level. 
And being a very local company and very Dutch oriented, uh, that that is a change. Yeah, so getting used to speaking English, uh, writing code uh, and documentation in English is something uh, teams are getting used to or more and more uh, getting used to it. But that is an, uh, in transition you have to go through and also build up the skills and help the teams uh, to develop those skills uh, to do that. And amongst that, uh, uh, communication is one aspect, but also uh, working together with, with uh, other organizations in different countries with different uh, cultural backgrounds, as I just mentioned, is, is also uh, uh, new skills our teams and developers have, have, to, to have to develop. But also, I think on the positive side, it, it, it's great to see that working more with open source, it made our company uh, and is making our company more attractive for international talent. Because uh, we see now uh, the, the, the teams working in open source, they have the documentation in English, uh, they, they are used to speaking English. And that also allows us now to, to hire uh, more international talent in those teams, which is more difficult in, in, in other teams in our organization. Um, I have a question that might be more directed to a NOSPOT that is established in, a, in, in the enterprise. So if you were asked to evaluate the win of open source software in, in money, in euros, dollars, whatever, uh, for your company, what would be the figures? Like how, how would you demonstrate it? I know it's kind of abstract and if you have some thoughts or maybe something that has worked in the past. Yeah, okay. Um, there, There is a study out there that says the value of open source is two, seven trillion? What was it? Anybody remember? Huh? 8.8 yeah. 8. 8 trillion. Trillion, right? So yeah, it was, it was a really high number. Um, so I don't exactly know the details of how they came up with that. And we haven't done that calculation, but I mean, it's it's quite obvious that there is high value. Yeah, how would I how would I go about it? I mean, I would, for example, you know, how much time would it require for us to write that software our, on our own as we used to do back in the day, as compared to it's um, freely available? Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe not sorry if this was part of the question, but I think it might be more about how can I convince of contributing back and contributing upstream is important. Not, of course, yeah, I'm, I'm using software. My, my okay. developers are using it, but. For, okay, good. Then uh, if I understand correctly, so I mean, to use open source software instead of writing code yourself is kind of a no brainer, right? Um, I mean, even if you had all the time in the world or all the money in the world, which obviously both you don't have, but you still wouldn't have uh, all the engineers necessary anymore these days, right? So, um, but how do you convince somebody, wait, it's actually also good to contribute back, yeah? So there's a study that was done by Frank Nagel, who's a Harvard Business uh, School professor. And it's a, it's a really thorough, good study. I read it and it's really interesting. So you know, done diligently according to scientific criteria and so forth. And so the claim or the result of the, one of the results, one of the main results of the study is companies who contribute back to open source benefit twice as much monetarily from this participation than companies who just, you know, are freeloaders and don't contribute back. Why is that? Because when you contribute back upstream, you're going through a feedback process. Uh, you know, you write code, you, you make the submission, and then somebody looks at your code and says, yeah, it's going in the right direction, but I think you might want to look into here, this and that, maybe make a correction here. Or they uh, refuse and say, you know, you need to make some major changes, blah, blah. You go through a feedback loop back and forth several times, and you are interacting with some of the brightest minds out there. And this is a training for you. You're going through a training process and this is learning by doing so you're really getting better and better by this interaction you're not just interacting with your own group with your own peer group in your company but with as i said some of the brightest minds out there and it's this is a not a, a one-time effect only but it keeps on giving 
Like even when you have already been in open source for a few years, it still trains your engineers. And that is why you actually get money value back from contributing upstream. And I think this is a very powerful argument that you want to give your engineers, uh, your, sorry, your, your executives who are skeptic and say, okay, free learning is fine, but we're not contributing back. That takes too much time. No, it is worth the time. I, f I fully agree on that. Uh, I think uh, there's so many aspects of contributing back that's valuable for your organization. I think you highlighted one of them. And another one, uh, it is often uh, with important open source projects use, there are some frustrations internally about features that are missing or things that they would love to see different. And oft sometimes I ask the questions, hey, did you provide that feedback back to the community? Did you suggest uh, that or at least get in touch if that's already on their roadmap and when it's uh, when will be implemented and maybe even offer some help to get it implemented and many reactions I get is good question no we did not that, do that and it was very surprisingly that after many of those teams get in, in contact with, with, with the community sometimes they figure out uh, the, uh, it was misinformation that it was already fixed or uh, they were using uh, or it's on the roadmap and will be shortly fixed. Or sometimes they got in, get invited from, hey, you have a great suggestion. Would you like uh, to help us uh, work on that? And uh, at one side really motivated the teams, but also helped the teams to get their goals uh, done. And so we are uh, four minutes until we finish. So my last question for you, is uh, do you have any advice for the audience on uh, steps to move forward in the organizations to advance innovation? And maybe also as a reflection, like what will be the role of the OSPO in all you have been uh, discussing around contributing back and uh, trying to demonstrate value? So just briefly like a summary of what's on your mind. So I think the role of OSPO at least I'll how I see it, it's a lot of change management. And uh, it's getting awareness for open source in your organization, removing barriers uh, to use open source, but also contribute to open source. And, and there are many aspects of it. And my biggest advice here is start small. Yeah? Outline uh, what, what's most important for, for your organization and see how you can translate that in short-term goals and see how, how can I make the first step? What do I need? Uh, you may not need a full dedicated OSPO team to get started. Hey, you can already uh, uh, start with a small team uh, or a small per group of persons, a working group with, uh, within your organization. There's probably already a lot of open source knowledge in your organization out there. But if you are able to bring that together, uh, you already can make the first steps uh, with, with bringing open source readiness in your organization to the next level. And if you build on that success, say you can grow from there and see uh, what's needed uh, to bring that further and maybe even scale up if needed. So the main role of an OSPO, in my opinion, is to make open source happen at your company. So that means number one, uh, lay the groundwork, create the foundations, make sure that open source is possible in a legally compliant way, in a, in a way that you know, suits the company's needs. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, incentivize and make your engineers like spread the good news and tell your engineers, hey, open source is really cool. Actually, the engineers already know that, you know, but now you can do it and uh, please do it. Go ahead. Yeah, that sort of thing. So oh, if you haven't seen them, maybe look at the Mercedes-Benz FOSS manifesto. That's one of our rules and guidelines for our engineers and our public commitment to open source. And uh, I think that's actually quite nice. This is tough to uh, top off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I fully agree on, the, uh, on what you're already referring to. But uh, I do see the role of OSPO as a guide, uh, internally as a public administration, to help all the different roles, uh, explaining what, what is the role of open source, uh, how can we contribute. So helping out all the different roles, doing the right thing being open as possible, contributing back, how to contribute back. So actually helping all the different roles to, to do the right thing. Um, and just keep doing that. Um, 
-hmm. it's a tough cookie sometimes but uh, just keep doing that and see it as a as a road that's just keep going up and down Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I know like we got a lot of questions. The good thing of this dashboard is that we can take those questions. Uh, maybe uh, what I've done in the past, and if you agree, is having some sort of blog post that uh, you can tackle those questions and answer them uh, more in detail. And we can publish for the audience and for those who are not here also to have access to, to this information. Uh, so just just remind on that, we, we don't have uh, plenty of time and all the time uh, here, but we will try to do our best to try to come with those questions um, and publish. So you can have them and you can share it and you can also see like what what is the audience uh, points of an interesting interesting interested interest and challenges and saying that i hope you enjoy i think you will be around yes. if you have to ask them questions thank you so much for all your insights and and sharing your stories and answer the questions thanks for the questions and thanks yeah thank you for participating and for the questions thank you oh sorry i forget to say so if someone from you get wants to get more into detail on the role of hospitals in the automotive sector and how automotive industries are doing open source uh tomorrow we have a panel similar to this but for, with uh Wolfgang from Mercedes, people from um, Volvo. Volvo and Toyota.